State Speaks. Our guest tonight is New York State Senator Jose M. Serrano. He's been in the Senate since 2005 and represents a beautiful complexity of neighborhoods, which includes Manhattan Community District 8's area of Resort Island and Yorkville. Also, a considerable portion of East Harlem, which is in Community District 11 in Manhattan, and also now part of the Upper West Side in Community District 7. He also represents the Bronx with the Community Districts 1, 4, and 5. Senator Serrano serves as the chair of the Senate Democratic Conference and is the ranking member of Senate Committee on Cultural Affairs, Tourism, Parks and Recreation. He also serves in the Committee for Civil Service and Pensions, Education, Environmental Conservation, Judiciary and Higher Education. So there are many issues you're involved with in our community and, uh, and all these other neighbors that you covered. Um, but um, if you don't mind, I'm going to just dive in some of the topics which are hot right now. You were at um, a recent community board, a full board meeting, and you mentioned member item reform as being very important. Uh, could you tell our audience exactly what member items are, what is the controversy, and what are you and your colleagues seeking to do? Well, member item reform um, is a legislation that I've written uh, to help overhaul the whole legislative grants system. Now, uh, far too often we hear about corruption in politics, and so many so often it leads to, to two, uh, in, in two paths. One of them is campaign finance transgressions, and the other is member items transgressions, where people abuse the system of legislative grants, giving grants to uh, organizations who don't deserve it, or money is somehow kicked back to the legislator. Now, because there's been so much controversy, the governor has done away with legislative grants, and doing so has taken away the power of the state elected official to bring grants to senior centers, to schools, to uh, neighborhood organizations who actually do need it and will do a good job to spend it. So the good groups are sort of paying the price for the bad apples. Uh, so we haven't had legislative grants for a number of years now. Uh, and my legislation would overhaul the system to make it more transparent uh, and to inspire confidence. And the way that it would do so would be removing conflicts of interest, um, having the Attorney General's office oversee uh, the legislative grants, making sure uh, that they are given out uh, evenly and not used as rewards or punishment uh, by leadership against legislators. And it is something that I, I believe in theory the governor supports because uh, when he put out his, uh, his book on ideas uh, as governor, one of the things he did mention was reform of the member item process. So uh, I mentioned at the uh, CB8 meeting that this is of critical importance because right now I think a lot of uh, worthy organizations that have long track records um, that rely heavily on government funds are not getting it. Many of them are closing their doors and uh, many of them are arts organizations, seniors centers, uh, after school programs. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it will be straightened out. Mm -hmm. With uh, the reconfiguration of district, now you have uh, part of the Upper West Side and there are always uh, similar issues I think between the Upper East Side and Upper West Side and one of them that you're involved with is uh, preservation of the Apthorpe um, mm -hmm. um, apartment building. Uh, could you tell us about the issues uh, that are you're engaged with on the Apthorpe, and how does that relate to issues you may see uh, in Yorkville? The uh, issue surrounding the Apthorpe is very interesting because, um, you know, being that I'm sort of the new kid on the block on the Upper West Side, but having known uh, all my life how beautiful West End Avenue and many of the areas in the in the section that I represent. I represent a chunk of the Upper West Side, roughly from 70th Street to 89th Street, uh, and it's uh, from Central Park over. Uh, and it's uh, pretty sizable, and it covers a lot of these historic um, buildings that have tremendous architectural and artistic significance. Um, and me coming from the arts, coming from theater, and uh, understanding how important the cultural sector is to New York, uh, I became very interested in the whole notion of preserving uh, the architectural integrity of these buildings. So there's, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of local organized groups who are pushing very hard uh, to save one building in particular, the Apthorpe, which is a, a really beautiful, uh, amazing, majestic building uh, on the on West End Avenue. And developers there are attempting to build uh, luxury penthouses on the top. Um, and it would sort of change the entire look of the building, uh, would raise it, uh, and it would also create shadows into the courtyard and, and sort of just, you know, really change the whole look of it. And uh, I testified uh, before the uh, Landmarks Commission against 
this plan and many other community residents did as well and other elected officials. And it is not, uh, uh, not unlike some of the issues faced uh, here in the Upper East Side, where we have a lot of historic districts as well, around Carnegie Hill, around the Met Museum. Uh, we have buildings there that are not only important to us now, but for future generations. How will uh, they know about our cultural legacy, our artistic and architectural legacy, if uh, you know, a, a new developer decides that they, uh, for profit, want to tear down an old building and, and create a, a structure that is more modern looking, but really not, not in tune with the overall character of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. It's very important for our area. Mm -hmm. Another very, very big part of your district is Roosevelt Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a very exciting um, transformation coming to them, which is the Cornell Technion. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? The Cornell campus uh, is slated to uh, be completed by 2017. Um, and it is, um, you know, in many ways, the vision of uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, as part of his legacy to uh, bring about the tech industry or make it bigger here in New York City. I think he understands and many of uh, us understand as well uh, that the future of New York City really is the tech industry. There was a time and a place when uh, the majority of our jobs in, in the city were manufacturing jobs. Those days are long gone. So the question is, where is the next industry? Um, you know, we know finance is a pillar, but tech can also be a pillar of jobs and finance uh, and uh, and um, you know sort of forward thinking in our community. So uh, the Cornell campus, uh, I think, is a great opportunity to bring the greatest minds from all over the world and, and homegrown talent as well uh, to educate them to be the innovators of of the next uh, the next generation. And uh, I'm hoping that that spurs a lot of jobs. And I hope that it also, you know, continues to put Roosevelt Island on the map. Um, as a great place to be, to, to work and, and, and be educated. It really is a wonderful island, a wonderful community, uh, but it has to be done right. And I think it's important that all of the elected officials speak with one voice and that we're in tune with the community's needs to ensure that this is done in a way that is very respectful of the residents on the island, that is very cognizant of the needs and make sure that we mitigate as much as, problem, uh, as, much as possible any problems that could arise. Mm -hmm. I know being on your mailing list that you reach out to communicate when your staff has hours on Roosevelt Island. Could you just tell everyone when they do have hours? With, with, an, mm -hmm. with a district as, as geographically large and diverse as, as mine, as you mentioned, the 29th Senate District sort of covering all these different areas geographically um, in the Bronx, Roosevelt Island, and in Manhattan. And the fact that we only get one district office and it's centrally located in East Harlem, uh, right here on 104th Street, uh, we think it's important, we in, uh, in my office, we believe it's important that we, we do community outreach monthly in all the different areas outside of our sort of base where our office is. So we do community hours on the Upper uh, West Side, mm -hmm. usually at St. Agnes Library mm -hmm. on Amsterdam Avenue. Mm -hmm. We do it in the Bronx, usually at a library or senior center. Uh, and we also do it every month on Roosevelt Island. And it's important because it's, it's very difficult, I think, for constituents to get up uh, to my office and you know we want to bring the office to them mm -hmm. so we send staff out there every month we set up shop uh, and uh, we you know are able to uh, to connect and, and give face time uh, to folks to senior citizens to residents on the island we've been doing our hours lately uh, at the Roosevelt Island Senior Center and uh, we'll try to find other venues uh, to try to mix it up but for now this seems to be a good spot we usually ask at the end what your contact information is, but since we're talking about it, how can constituents contact you? Well, my office is uh, 157 East 104th Street. Uh, zip code is 10029. That's here in East Harlem. Uh, my phone number is 212-828-5829. And you could always shoot me an email at serrano at nysenate.gov. Uh, and that's uh, the best way to reach in. My staff is very responsive. My staff is always ready to, uh, to help in any way that they can. And so if constituents can't reach me directly, they can, they can speak with my staff. Well, I actually do have a little story related to that because in the building uh, my husband and I live in in the Upper East Side, every year we do a clothing and food drive for um, a, a local charity. Um, and some of the people had um, donated certain materials that were not accepted by that charity. I was able to call your staff, and mm -hmm. they were able to direct me to... Um, an organization within the Upper East Side. So I do want to mention that mm -hmm. if people do want to um, 
have questions about uh, charitable activities, mm -hmm. um, they can contact your staff because right. they know exactly where to go. So. Right, that's good to know. I, I'm, I'm very proud of my staff. They're, they're a very energetic staff, and they also know uh, that the best way to, to handle, you know, we don't have to have all the answers, but we have to know where to find the answers. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a little research and uh, a little digging on Google sometimes, but yeah. we're able to find answers usually. So and actually it's rather than just calling with complaints, right. people can call to find out how they can help too. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's another true. great that's thing. A, that's a good story. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, on to something a little different, which is the health care laws, which mm -hmm. are um, the, on the headlines every single day because you and um, Senator Liz Kruger held a community forum in the Upper East Side to inform residents about the Affordable Care Act and what the options were to New York State residents. And since this is such an enormous topic, could you help um, simplify it, help mm -hmm. the viewers understand what choices they have in New York? Well, first of all, since you mentioned one of my favorite people in the world, Liz Kruger, um, you know, I just want to... Uh, give her a shout out and, and thank her for all the work that she does and uh, she is my mentor as many uh, folks know she's the one who recruited me out of the city council to run for the state senate and uh, she's someone who I work very closely with and we're very fortunate to have her not just uh, here on the east side but uh, the entire state of New York is very fortunate to have mm -hmm. uh, someone as, uh, as strong and powerful and fearless as, as Liz Kruger. And on this issue, again, she's shown uh, tremendous leadership. I think she knows that constituents uh, are very interested in the Affordable Care Act, but may be a little confused by it, uh, may have some concerns about how to sign up. And of course, there's been all this drama with the website. Mm -hmm. uh, now, peeling away those layers and sort of getting down to what's really happening here, uh, Liz had uh, put together a community forum, which I co-sponsored along with her. Uh, to bring uh, navigators and people who would actually sit with constituents and help them uh, deal with signing up for the new health care law, which is, by all accounts, a major improvement uh, over anything that we've had. It ensures health care. Um, it, it will overall will save a lot of money because uh, when you have a healthier society, uh, mm -hmm. you have less chronic illness over time and, and a lot of less maintenance costs over time. And uh, many of the plans that are being offered are uh, um, a lot less expensive than, than many are paying now for uh, insurance out on, out on their own, you mm -hmm. know, without employer-covered insurance. So they, that, uh, that workshop that she put together uh, a few weeks back mm -hmm. uh, was one that was hugely attended. I mean, it was standing room only, only in a huge, huge auditorium of a space. And um, again, this is just one of, of countless issues where Liz has been ahead of the curve and making sure that she's responsive to the community. And I, as her neighbor, uh, geographically, uh, she represents the 28th Senate District. I represent the 29th, and we work very closely together on these issues. Mm -hmm. You were recently cited as a leader in environmental issues. And um, there is the continued controversy of hydrofracking. What are the actions you've initiated to protect New York's water and environment? Well, there's a, a couple of ways of dealing with uh, stopping hydrofracking. I mean, ultimately, that is my goal. My goal is to see that hydrofracking uh, is never becomes the law here in, in New York or uh, that we always prevent it from happening because um, there has been, I believe, conclusive scientific data which proves that there is no such thing as a safe form of hydrofracking. Um, it is inherently unsafe and it has caused uh, a tremendous amount of uh, environmental damage in places like Pennsylvania. It's caused uh, earthquakes in other states, and um, it's been proven to be very unsafe for our environment, our drinking water, and our air and soil. Um, and I applaud the governor for uh, really not jumping to approve hydrofracking here in New York, and he's been taking uh, a lot of time on this issue, and I hope that that's a sign that hydrofracking does not, does not happen here. Um, I have uh, been a co-sponsor of legislation to, to create an outright ban against hydrofracking. Um, I've been co-sponsors of other legislation which is similar to that, but bear in mind that I serve in a Republican-controlled state Senate where many of those Republican senators are not as convinced as I am that hydrofracking is unsafe and uh, many of them actually want it. So uh, unfortunately it's difficult to pass legislation uh, for a moratorium on, on hydrofracking in an environment like that. So. Aside from legislatively, we have to keep the pressure up. 
Uh, and we do that by press conferences, by having rallies. Uh, I've been on the steps of City Hall numerous times with advocates uh, from all over the state saying that hydrofracking has just been proven to be unsafe. Um, and we, as long as we keep beating that drum and uh, letting the press know the dangers of hydrofracking, um, I, I really do think that we will um, hopefully see a day where there's a complete ban. Okay. You have been uh, outspoken on the needs for tighter gun control, which is um, it's, uh, a big issue nationally. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've had some enormous tragedies mm -hmm. uh, in Connecticut and, and other states. Um, and while we have a reputation for having tight gun control, um, we always feel that there could be more controls, I suppose. Um, you had actually sent a letter to um, uh, urging United States senators to increase gun control on the federal level um, by requiring background checks and record keeping all U.S. gun sales. Um, is there anything that can be done nationally to help New York? Absolutely. I think. I think the, uh, the most important place to have strict gun control legislations is on a national, mm -hmm. national level because on a state level, um, we can do so much here, but so many of the guns that are in, uh, involved in crime uh, here in the city and uh, throughout the state are from out-of-state guns. Mm -hmm. uh, guns find their way into New York from places like Virginia, other places where they really have very weak gun laws. Um, and um, if, unless we have sort of a national you know, ban on assault rifles or a national plan, at least, to deal with illegal guns. And, you know, the technology is there. We have so much technology uh, to be able to track guns, to be able to curb the sales of guns, to close all the loopholes at gun shows and things of that nature. So, yeah, I think the New York Safe Act, which we passed last year, is a major first step. And I think it sent, uh, it sent a very strong message throughout the country that New York State is... Uh, means business when it comes to gun control. Uh, but I think really the, the federal government, uh, Congress, uh, needs to really step forward with a comprehensive plan to deal with illegal guns uh, and, and make sure that they do not fall into the wrong hands. I mean, we've seen one, uh, one too many, far too many tragedies and, and uh, you know, too many to even, mm -hmm. or too painful to sort of recount. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's, um, I, I don't think that there are any legitimately strong arguments for uh, standing against common sense gun control. Um, and I think that's why we really need to get it done on a national level. On a very different topic, you have a work with um, uh, the assembly member in the West Side, Linda Rosenthal, um, about uh, regulating operations known as puppy mills. Mm -hmm. And pets are a very important issue to many people in Manhattan, especially the Upper East Side. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is a topic uh, a lot of people would have a lot of interest in. What led you to become involved with it? Well, I give a lot of credit to Linda Rosenthal for this legislation. Puppy mills is something that uh, I think many people may not fully understand what's happening here. You know, we see, you know, beautiful, cute puppies in a store window, a pet shop window, and uh, we, we all want them, and, and, and they, we all know how much they bring to our lives. I mean, I, I was a former dog, dog owner myself for, for about 16, 17 years, and I know uh, how much uh, they bring to the home and to, and to your, your life. But what's happening with puppy mills is that there is this, you know, this profit-driven uh, system where there are horrendous and deplorable conditions mm -hmm. under which uh, dogs are bred um, and kept in small cages and inbred, so there's a lot of diseases and chronic uh, congenital problems with the animals, and then sold at, at these uh, pet shops, local pet shops on the west side and other places on the east side, for astronomical prices. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really a shame because uh, I think it really, it, it, it makes it harder for the dogs who are in the shelter system who really really need help and really need owners who love them uh, to get a chance of being in a home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that these puppy mills, many people did not realize how deplorable the conditions were uh, and uh, how unsanitary and how unsafe that, that they were and how they would lead to many stray animals because uh, someone unsuspectingly will spend large amount of money on a, on a, a puppy uh, only a you know, few months later to find out it has some congenital 
disease that they can't afford to mm -hmm. treat, uh, and sometimes a dog winds up out in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes a problem, and uh, I think it's really important, and I'm, again, kudos to Linda Rosenthal for shining a spotlight on this, uh, to sort of uh, get people to change their idea and think a little bit about uh, when they're in the market for an animal, where are they going to get this dog from? And I think the best place to get a dog is through our, our shelters, uh, where we can make sure that they have all their vaccinations and mm -hmm. that we, we, there's affordable health care for them. And, um, you know, whether you're into pure breed animals or not, I mean, I, 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 perfect, I, I, I love the mixed breed animals. Mm -hmm. I, I had a, a mixed breed dog and um, he was just a lot of fun and he was very healthy for a very long time and uh, very smart. And, I, and, you know, I think everyone has their taste, but I, again, my, the dog I had, we, we found him as a stray mm -hmm. and oh. took him home. And, and there's, there's plenty, and mm -hmm. he was amazing. He mm -hmm. was the best pet I ever had. So I, I definitely do think that there is uh, uh, some great options at the shelters. Mm. Some other topics that you've been involved with, um, there was some video, I think, on, on your um, Senate website. You spoke out on support of legislation against domestic violence. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening in the state Senate level on that topic? It's one of those, one of those issues that it's, it's, so, um, it's so sad to, to even talk about it because you hear stories uh, about uh, people who uh, are the victims of domestic violence. And, and here in the 29th Senate District where we have places like the South Bronx and East Harlem where there's a vi very high immigrant population. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes immigrants are a little nervous about coming forward when they've been the victims of any kind of crime. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe their immigration status is not completely in order. They don't want to rock the boat and uh, they won't come forward to the police. So not only are, are they sort of suffering in silence, but the statistics are, are usually not accurate. Usually mm -hmm. the domestic violence numbers are a lot higher in a community than people think, mm -hmm. uh, but because it's so much of it goes unreported. And what I try to do is um, I try to reach out to the immigrant community to make sure that they understand that in a place like New York City, uh, coming forward um, uh, because of something like Executive Order 41, coming forward would not pr put you in jeopardy for your immigration status. If you've been the victim of any kind of crime, you should come forward to the police and report it uh, for your own safety. So I, I, I do think that it's important that, you know, that immigrants, the immigrant community are, are fully aware of that and fully convinced that Executive Order 41 is there for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and especially the victims of domestic violence who oftentimes just suffer in silence, they remain in the shadows, uh, and they're not coming forward. And that's why, uh, that's one of the reasons why I spoke about it on the Senate floor, because I want to make sure that people across the state know that this is an important issue. Great. We have some lighter topics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for instance, uh, you've been in the press about your fashion statements. Um, Switching from traditional necktie, neckties to colorful bow ties. And of course, the Upper East Side, we're, we're very into fashion. <laughs> um, you've also become very athletic since we last met, although mm -hmm. you, you were talking about a marathon you ran quite a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing to make such a change? And this is an example for your constituents. Well, I'm over 40 now, and uh, when I was about to turn 40, um, my wife and I uh, welcomed our, our beautiful daughter. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's now about to be two years old. And at that time, it was sort of a, a crossroads for me because I had been uh, overweight for, for quite a while, for almost 10 years at that point, and uh, unhealthy. And I felt that um, even though I had been running, and, and uh, I had been a runner going back you know, 20 years ago when I was in college, and I ran cross country, and I ran the New York City Marathon in 1995, uh, I guess my years in public office and... Uh, had, had sort of, uh, I've fallen off the tracks a mm -hmm. little bit and uh, put on weight and um, uh, seeing the birth of my daughter and realizing mm -hmm. how important it is to, uh, to be there for my, my two kids, mm -hmm. I have a seven year old son as well. Um, I made some, some more significant changes and over the course of about 18 months, I was able to lose about 65 pounds, close to 70 pounds. And, uh, and in doing yeah. so, just sort of looking for, for changes mm -hmm. in, in general. So I, I've been running a lot. Uh, and eating a lot better, mm -hmm. and one of the keys is also juicing. Now, not, not steroid juicing. I'm talking <laughs> about vegetable, a vegetable juicer, yeah. oh, great. Uh, which I have mm -hmm. at home, mm -hmm. and uh, I do it quite often, mm -hmm. and uh, it really does help make mm -hmm. a huge difference when you're trying to cut back mm -hmm. um, because it's so nutrient-dense. It really mm -hmm. does curb your appetite 
in a lot of other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but you were referencing, I think, my, my bow tie, and right. there's a funny story behind that because about a year ago, I, I had always thought that, uh, you know, that it looked uh, dapper, but I was afraid to sort of give it a, a shot. Mm -hmm. And I, when I went out to buy new suits, because I no longer fit in my, my heavier suits, mm -hmm. Uh, and I was buying smaller suits, and I see the bow ties there. I say, you know what? I'm going to take the plunge. Mm -hmm. So I, I put one on, and um, I wore it to work, and you know, it, the rest is history. I haven't stopped. Mm -hmm. And the funny story is, um, uh, last spring, uh, Prince Harry, <laughs> of all people, was in East Harlem. And he was here to meet with uh, Harlem RBI mm -hmm. and to encourage the kids there. And uh, one of the things he... Uh, so I, I got to meet him, and, and I was, you know, very proper. I, you know, I know there's certain etiquette you're supposed to have when you meet anyone from the royal family. Mm -hmm. First thing he says to me, well, I don't want to do a fake British accent, but he said, I love your bow tie. <laughs> and uh, somehow that got into the papers and, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in Albany, and it, it became a little bit of a thing. But mm -hmm. it, it, I'm glad he enjoyed the bow tie. And coming, mm -hmm. you know, I, I enjoy British fashion, too, so if he... He, I think he definitely knows what he's talking about. Yeah, that was also in the news about you're meeting him mm -hmm. and uh, the Harlem RBI's Project Coach. I mean, that's a little bit out of our community mm -hmm. district, but what is that program? Well, Project Coach, um, I mentioned Harlem RBI. Project Coach is a, a program that is receiving funding from the Royal Foundation. So the Royal Foundation is, is you know, the Royal family, and I guess they're looking to uh, help out not only in, 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 in England, but uh, here in the United States. And uh, one of the groups that they've given money to is Harlem RBI for this project coach, and mm -hmm. it's sort of a mentoring program uh, for kids. And um, uh, he was there on the baseball field uh, taking wow. swings. Yeah, uh, Mark Chisera from mm -hmm. the New York Yankees was being his uh, batting practice uh, pitcher, mm -hmm. and he was throwing to him, and he was hitting them, and uh, it was a great time. The kids were really impressed uh, meeting a royal, wow. but he was a down-to-earth person. Mm -hmm. You would not know that he was a member of the royal family, being that he was so relaxed mm -hmm. and uh, seemed genuinely uh, interested in uh, the folks uh, here in East Harlem and, um, and, and in that program in particular. That's really great that you're mm -hmm. able to bring these people from such different backgrounds together. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're just about out of time, and I want to thank you for being here. We look forward to have you return yet again. Yes. Um, and I want to thank everyone for um, watching tonight. And uh, for those of you who live in Community District 8, uh, please go to our website, cbam.com, which you can then see uh, past episodes of CB8 Speaks. You can look at the calendar for meetings of Community Board 8 and all the committees. And get involved. Come to the meetings and uh, hear what's going on in your community. And thank you. See you again. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, um, yeah we uh, covered just about everything. And uh, yeah. one thing that we didn't cover, one little thing was... Um, Support of women's uh, pay equality. You also right. spoke about that. Right. Yeah. This day and age, we think we're such a modern society, but there is still tremendous pay inequity. Mm -hmm.